Wind Horse is our innate ability to uplift ourselves and our environment by giving rise to a positive energy that is both relaxed and disciplined. Since 1981, Wind Horse Community Services has integrated this understanding with modern conventional therapies, meditation, and contemplative traditions in the development of at-home, whole-person mental health recovery. Wind Horse Journal is dedicated to the mission of communicating decades of clinical and personal experience to professionals, educators, students, and anyone seeking recovery options. Please join the dialogue. Welcome to Windhorse Journal Entry 057, part one of a conversation on Lungta in the time of Corona, leadership during a crisis. This offering brings together leaders of Windhorse Community Services and its sister entity, Windhorse Elder Care, to reflect on how they have managed throughout the past eight weeks while responding as an organization to the threat of COVID-19. Holly Banerjee Gallagher, Jack Gippel, and Stephanie Kinberg, joined by moderator Chuck Knapp, share on both personal and collective levels what they have experienced through significant alterations to how we go about our work. Among the lessons is an awareness of the vulnerabilities in common with our clients, and as Rinpoche had pointed out, an opportunity to see our tendencies. Let's listen now to journal entry 057, part one of a conversation on Lumpta in the time of Corona, leadership during a crisis. Welcome everyone to the Windhorse Journal. This morning we're hosting a discussion about taking care in this time of pandemic and particularly how to take care of our minds and health. On March 13th, Zigar Kongshul Rinpoche, a Tibetan Buddhist teacher and dear friend of Windhorse Community Services, met with us as his instructions were so timely and accurate we thought it would be helpful to discuss what he addressed, particularly now that we've had about six weeks of life probably unlike anything most of us have ever experienced. We're pleased to be joined this morning by Polly Banerjee Gallagher and Jack Gipple, both of whom were part of the previous podcast with D.R. Contral and Stephanie Kineberg. Thank you all so much for being with us this morning, and would you please introduce yourselves in any particular order? Thanks, and thanks a lot, Chuck, for that introduction. Um, I'm Polly, as Chuck said, and I'm Director of Windhorse Community, Community Services. Services. And, um, when Rumche came on March 13th, as Chuck, you were mentioning, it marked pretty much a full year that I've been in this role and coincided with going into this mode of living we've been living through for the past six weeks, as you said, and about to complete our seventh today. So I'm very pleased to be here because it was such a privilege to actually talk more closely about that aspect. My name is Stephanie Kinberg, and I'm Director of Operations at Windhorse Elder Care and a team supervisor. I worked at Windhorse Community Services for about, I think, five and a half years prior to Windhorse Elder Care, and I just am really happy to be here and feel honored to be included. Jack? I'm Jack Kippel. I'm the Clinical Services Manager at Windhorse Community Services. Um, I've worked with Windhorse for over 20 years now. And I just I find that um, Zigar Control Rinpoche's talk's always quite provocative and fascinating. And I think he's talking about what seem like really lofty ideas that we're bringing to earth, and they're actually incredibly practical ideas. And that, I think, is my hope today is that we can help bring these ideas to earth some more for everybody to think and talk about. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. And uh, it's a little strange to be in a Zoom format instead of all sitting in the same room. So we will be able to still generate the same kind of spirit of conversation in this uh, unusual feature of this isolation period. I think to maybe name here that we've already been talking about to some extent is that we've been in various types of isolations for going on seven weeks now. And reflecting back on that, it's, it feels like there have been stages of this. Winter's view, we, we talk about whole person. So there's the person's body, but also the speech, which is about relationships and more of the emotional tenor of life, and then the mind. And so that, that comprises more of a whole person. And this illness 
has had a body speech mind effect for sure. And, and I think uh, I would uh, really hearing you all talk about the body speech mind of this illness and, and possibly something about the stages of it as we roll through these last seven weeks. Well, I could say something about the stages. Um, as we were mentioning, when Rinche came, we were still unclear as to what was going to happen, what we needed to do. I know that in the leadership, myself, Jack Dippel, and um, Jeff Oderick, we were trying to sort out like, what is it all going to look like. And when Rinche did this podcast with us, he went through it in a certain way that was relevant then and continues to be relevant. So I think that he really helped us uh, ground into the potential of what the body speech mind aspect of this just the fact that the very next day we started to manifest in a very different environment we used to be in person together and then we became these you know talking heads from neck up <laughs> instead of being able to see each other in person so our homes turned into the offices or the environment of what we are used to so i think that for me you know it was very stark to see the body aspect go so quickly. And um, I think Rinche really was trying to help us think about the relational aspect of this as well, which is how do we relate with one another in this form? That even though we're calling this isolation, that it's, it doesn't have the quality of like just protecting oneself and isolating away, you can actually be even more connected to one another in our communities. Like I know that Stephanie, we've been closely in touch because we're sister organizations to share information. And we did that with other organizations as well. And really thinking more globally, you know, Jake pointed to that in this podcast quite a bit of like, how do we open ourselves up so that we're more globally connected than we might even realize. And, you know, I think really working with our mind is something that he was helping us understand. For me, what he was talking about with well, the unknown is scary. How to recognize that without getting too hard on ourselves of wanting to protect ourselves and our loved ones, but that he was pointing to be aware of when that turns into aggression. I, I've actually taken that to heart quite a bit. It's like having the fear is one thing, but acting it out in a certain way because I'm not aware. So from a mind quality, and that's been my experience is this progression of the body, speech, mind. And I think that it's not a one-time thing. I think it's a, a continuous, like paying attention. And those things have also evolved, like how we pay attention to the body. And I think that as we have been collaborating, I think it's been very helpful to share information among each other because we don't really know, even listening to the health experts and the government, and we don't know exactly how to be at this point. So I've been really appreciative of using Jay's, you know, Jack, your point was so, poignant time-wise when Unche came and that we couldn't see him in person in a community, but the fact that we were able to have him come and do a podcast, it just seemed like the, just the right timing. Remember saying that, Jack? Absolutely. I mean, the word that comes to me is auspicious. It couldn't have been timed to the day more accurately. It was a Friday the 13th, and it was ironic because we've been preparing for weeks for Rinpoche to come and, you know, who's going to set up the room and how, you know, all the things that go to hosting someone, and then that just all blew up. And it was the beginning of this great, I mean, I think of what you were saying, Chuck, about the stages. There's kind of building up. We've been talking for weeks about this coming. The first wave seemed to break on that, that day on the, the 13th, and it brought a lot of energy. We had prepared a lot, so I wouldn't say it was exactly chaos, but there was a surge of energy disruption and we got there early and we stayed late i don't think we went home till about 8 p.m that night um and it was a day just kept going and um there's a lot to kind of organize and handle and it's very deep in the kind of um, philosophy and practice of windhorse is this idea of synchronizing body we talk often body speech mind and so um it's like how do you and that's not that esoteric it's a very practical concept it's like how do you speak in ways that are aligned with how you feel and how you perceive the world and your physical self. How do those all come together in a synchronized way? In our understanding of disturbances of mind is that, that 
one way to look at this is when those get desynchronized or one maybe even one turned off and people are living in completely in one of those realms without communicating with the other parts of them. And that, that was the great challenge as this wave of energy broke over us. You know, it was a challenge to stay synchronized and we did because um, that's what we do and that's what we've done for decades and that we, every person and family system we work with and every team that's assembled is a unique kind of interpersonal environment. And this is what we do. We synchronize environments. And I think we've, I'm really happy with how we have responded. And it's not over by any means. This, this pandemic has blown up almost everybody's plans about what the future is going to look like. I have kids in their 20s that completely blew up their plans about work and school. If you think you know what you're going to be doing in six months, um, well, that's good, but that's definitely an illusion. But we live in an extraordinary time of change. Um, so. you, what you're saying there, Jack, reminds me of a, the saying that's well known. I first heard it in Yiddish, and I, I wish I could say it in Yiddish, but it's man plans, God laughs. Right. Yeah. Um, so j just to name, you know, P Polly and Jack, what you're just uh, describing is that in talking about that first stage, I, you know, as, a, as an older person and more vulnerable, I can't tell you how good it felt to feel protected by you all. A lot of compassion coming toward all of us. At the same time, a lot of precision. It was really a beautiful thing to be feeling protected by the leadership like that. And Stephanie, I was thinking a lot about Windhorse Elder Care and knowing, knowing you all had uh, the same thing on your plate. And I was aware that Polly and Jack, you and our operations manager, you, you all didn't have weekends. You, you know, that, that was a long Friday, but you all, I know that that became a long no weekend. And Stephanie, you must have had a similar thing on your plate. Yes, Chuck, definitely. And as Polly knows, um, we were kind of going through it together, really, mm -hmm. from the beginning. And like Polly had said, we were collaborating the whole time because all of this is so new to us and we were learning so much. It's a huge opportunity to work with one's mind. And I feel like Rimchase teachings, they were like Jack and Polly mentioned, they were so timely and very auspicious because it really helped all of us work with our minds around the situation and really created some guiding principles for us to think about um, moving forward as we navigate, you know, the situation. And also I think our, our training in Windhorse has helped us tremendously uh, navigate this situation on how to respond in a really open, compassionate, and precise way. Uh, but honestly, I, you know, Polly's and the Wind Horse Community Services leadership help, it would have been much more challenging for us at Wind Horse Elder Care. So I deeply appreciate everything they've done for us. Well, the feeling is mutual because I feel like there was such a sharing of ideas, right? Sharing of whatever we each heard, we thought of the other and said, oh, we should know this and we should share this. There's still much more to navigate as you're saying. Um, but yeah, the feeling's mutual. Yeah, thank you. So from a stages standpoint, we've named the kind of atmosphere of, of uncertainty that rolled in, that wave breaking over us, like as you the term used, Jack. And then there's the personal side of this and knowing that you all are trying to take care of organizations in the meantime, you have your, your personal lives, and then, there, then our, there's our clients and families and staff, and everybody's trying to figure out what on earth is going on here, um, not to mention, of course, the, our political leaders. I think that first phase, as is, is you're naming, there was so much uncertainty in that. And then after a while, when we got to see kind of what the pattern would look like and, and adjusting and some people are getting ill some people you know they're getting through it or not you know depending on what who you're working with living with and you're and connected with um all of a sudden that that opening kind of shock became more of a protracted heavy presence and an alteration of our usual patterns of living and i'm just curious at, at a personal level as well what's it been like for you all to roll through these kind of from where we started to where we are now I can speak to that. I feel like at first it was, I felt really ungrounded and it was really important that I tried to implement some sort of rhythm once things fell apart, really. And then once I got into a rhythm, 
things just seemed to be a bit more simple. I didn't feel like I didn't have as much of a drive to be more outward. Uh, so I felt the opportunity to go inward much more, which just naturally gave me more time to self-reflect. And I think that has really helped ground me throughout this process as well. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I'm hoping things do get back to whatever our new normal is going to be, that I still can take some of these things that I've tried to implement and continue to do that as I have to go outward again. Right. Yeah, but I think there's been a shaking. It's shaken up. I think what I, I kind of connect with what you're saying, Stephanie. There's a period of, at first, kind of unsettledness. And then, you know, as time goes on, there's something awakening, you know, like every every time in a personal or a kind of global period, like is equal and they're valid and they're not there. I mean, this idea of normal is a problem. I've been, I like to quote uh, Bruce Coburn's old song from the 80s, I think it was, um, or maybe it was the 70s. The trouble with normal is it always gets worse. And we've gotten into a very bad and degrading normal collectively, I think. And there's something as uh, disturbing as this is, it's also kind of been shaking, it's like this deep, deep collective shake that's happened. And at first it's quite unsettling. And then all the kind of the dreck that doesn't belong as it falls away and a certain uh, kind of uh, coming down and ground. And um, I, I hear different people say, you know, when things open up, they don't want to go back to what was. They don't really want to return to the old normal we had accepted that was actually full of a lot of destructive things. I think that it's important in any time of upheaval and crisis, personally or collectively, I mean, since it's going to happen, you have to kind of embrace it because you know, we're only, we're like that big in the plan where our ability to act, it's, it's there, but it's not, it's not as big as we often think it is. And so uh, roll with it, accept it, and uh, look for the opportunities. There, there are opportunities in times of crisis, and I, I, I'm on the lookout for those. <laughs> you know, personally and organizationally, and I hope socially, we're we're also looking for opportunities. You know, politically, globally. So. Yes. When Jay was talking about this uh, opportunity to see our tendencies, how do we lead? Um, I think Chuck, you know, personally. One of the kind of maybe more mundane things, going shopping or engaging in the ways that right now we need to, it can feel more exhausting because I can't rely on my habitual way of getting in my car, getting out there, getting my car, just shopping away. You know, now it's like, okay, I've got to, got to wipe my hands. I've got to put my mask on. I want to, you know, care for myself and others in this way. So it can feel like we're starting over again from learning our just how to function and it can have a quality of a bit of um, more tiredness for me uh, also this projection of when you don't see people's faces you don't really know like we we connect so much with one another right so i'm like is it okay to look at each other <laughs> is it okay to wave so kind of really adapting to the fact that yes, those are still okay. You can, it's actually more needed right now is how do we reach out without being able to, to do it in the same way that we've been used to. So I, I've noticed that in myself of trying to relearn because I, I want that warmth and care to come through, but how do you do that through like Zoom mm -hmm. or through when you're taking a walk and people are all masked and far away from you. Mm -hmm. Polly, what you're talking about reminds me of what we were talking about recently, a kind of a paradox of oftentimes feeling lonely and kind of disconnected in ways having a stronger sense of actually being connected to others at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if you'd say more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I reflect back on the podcast talk that Rinche gave, that was what he was offering to us. A global connection can feel. I mean, he was really expressing like in all our lifetimes, we've never been in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. If we think about human beings anywhere really in the world, most of us are doing a similar thing or having done it where we've had to stay home and get creative as to how we're doing things. Somehow like when he talked about 
the global connection and how we're sharing this, it helped me to just relax more because I'm still alone, right? But then when I think about any one of you, you're doing a similar thing. And if we can think about wishing everybody else to have some sense of ease as well, I don't know, it makes me feel more connected, alone, <laughs> being, being alone and more connected. So, you know, we have this um, transcript of Room Chase talk, and as I was really reflecting on this, um, we were just talking about opportunities, right? And then being able to see our minds in, in a way of what our tendency can be to ourselves. Components that helps us to keep going forward, keep deepening. And Stephanie, what you were saying about, and well, actually both you and Jack, like we don't necessarily want to go right back to what we were. There's so much more to learn here, so much more to bring together. I mean, when we think about our, our earth and what we've seen across the globe of animals coming out, how do we welcome them? more into our mix and not just become this dominant species that we've always been and continue to be and we see the skies that's brighter and cleaner and clearer everywhere stepping up into like you can't you can't breathe it was getting to that level but now peacocks are dancing <laughs> you know it's pretty amazing so i just wanted to just point to what Mche was talking about with this softening of our mentality with kindness and compassion so when these kinds of thoughts come up, you know, wanting to kind of protect ourselves, well, really realizing that there, everybody's going through this. And there are people who are in uh, much more difficult positions than we are. In this country, especially, there's so much privilege here. And within our country, there's levels of privilege, right, as to how people have been impacted and how do we reach out so that this level of like potential loneliness that we feel. Like, I think I feel more lonely when I feel like I'm trying to just keep to myself and, and be protective of myself. Even the thought of other people and what they might be going through feels less lonely to me mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and feels more like a shared way of looking at how we're going through this together. We've never had that before. We've heard of disasters in other countries and we're like, this sucks, you know, but there's always the feeling of it's happening to them as much as we want to connect, now we know what it feels like and we can kind of join other people in that. So that, that was some of what I was thinking. In the face of potential aloneness and loneliness, um, how do we stay, continue to stay open? And I think Rumche in this particular talk was trying to bring light to that. Yes, our own vulnerabilities and how vulnerable we all are. And then realizing everybody feels this vulnerability. And when we can connect to that, we're naturally all gonna feel more openness, compassion, and connection with others. Like you were saying, Polly, we are all in this together. So I think naturally we just have a greater appreciation and longing for connection. You know, I've been thinking about some of the Windhorse clients, either I work with directly or I know about what's going on in lots of the teams and people are responding differently also. Predictably, a number of our clients have had a hard time with this because a big point of contact we've shifted to is this, this virtual contact. We've stayed in close social contact with people who can tolerate this kind of, you know, base. Some people it's made much more isolated. And, and I've heard of clients, people we work with, actually kind of liking it. Like one of my clients looking at me with kind of a twinkle in his eye and saying, um, now you know how I feel, like all the time. A little like fearful and like I can't go out. In a certain way he's relaxed because now the rest of the culture isn't just rolling by as if there isn't a problem here. He experiences it as more congruent, like he feels like the world is meeting him more. There's other clients who were hard for the team to make contact with if they would resist physical contact and tending to isolate. And, and then suddenly the only way they could meet was on the computer. And what I've heard is several people, they've blossomed into it. You know, they're like pressing the time right to the edge. You know, there's this thing you can do on Zoom where you screen share. And so they're, they're taking people on their team into the worlds that they live on the computer. So it's, it's really interesting. There are opportunities for meeting and, and uh, finding connection and rapport that aren't immediately available in kind of physical presence. Let me, let me just reflect a little bit on, on what y'all are saying. It's remarkable that when Kansha Rinpoche was talking, there was the, the sense of 
pointing to how in this all together we are on some level. But I don't think the world has ever had the same feeling as being as interconnected as we are. This thing is really rolling around and it creates a certain kind of common ground that I think you're all naming in, in your own way. I think there's also possibly in the isolation that hasn't hit other countries yet and, and places where they may not be able to isolate in the same way. So this is a stage of this we're rolling through at this point in our particular culture but the intention to be connected in the isolation is probably different too because of the contrast that's been shown to us. Yeah. So it's really an interesting thing to try to take in. And a term, I, I had written the introduction for Rinpoche's podcast, and I remember thinking about how we've been so organized in certain ways to be thinking in us and them terms, and this is to an us and us, hopefully. And hopefully that'll produce a little more synchronization of the body, speech, and mind of the planet at any level, but hopefully we're on a path here. So this is really interesting to have you all pan back and look at the various levels of the stages and also, you know, running more global with it. And I'm curious at, at a real kitchen sink level, like, how do you get through your day? How did you find yourself moving from the normal way of living into now I'm in my home, I'm fortunate enough to still have work, and at the same time, I've got to get through my day. I'd like to hear what you say about that. I thrive on a schedule. So when this happened, there's a part of me that was like, woohoo, I don't have to have a schedule. But then I was like, this isn't going to serve me. I don't do well. My, I actually can get more depressed and feel like I'm not being productive. I would say the first couple of days, we started on Zoom. So I would wear a nicer top, but I would still wear my sweatpants or pajama bottoms. <laughs> but somehow I started to shift that even, and I started to wear my work clothes in the house. So make sure I still shower every day. Showering you know, has that enlivening feeling. But if you don't have to engage in the world, there's a part of me that's like, eh, do I want to do this? I mean, do I need to? And the answer to myself is yes. It's good for me to do. There's like a certain waking up that can happen. And the discipline of not necessarily like eating while I'm in the meeting, because that's not something I typically do. I try to eat before and knowing that there's a meeting coming up. So trying to keep able, you know, my husband Scott and I, we have to share the house too. So trying to figure out like, how are we gonna navigate being together more consistently? And, and at the same time, both of us are working. And a sense of humor of like, this was something that um, Scott actually read online. It's like, you can have a third person there. If one of us is like, irritated by the other person leaving dishes in the sink, for instance, we're like, honey, can you believe it? Cheryl's doing this thing again. <laughs> left dishes in the sink. Some playful quality of how we can relate to the fact that we're together, even though, you know, we enjoy being together, but it's also nice to have time apart. And then when we get back together at the end of the day, we change our clothes into our comfy clothes at home. And you're like, how's your day? How was your day? And as you said, Chuck, in the beginning, especially for the three of us, um, Jack, Jeff, and myself, weekends, it blended in. There was no weekend. In the evenings, it was getting a little too overpowering in my days. So I think that as leadership, we actually helped each other. Remember, Jack, where we were like, we're going to have a weekend this weekend. Yeah, right. it took a while. It took a number of weeks <laughs> to get there. <laughs> exactly, or at least one day. How can we do this? So I think it was also supporting each other and having friends. You know, Stephanie and I are also friends. So we we're, we're always like sending each other messages or things that are uplifting and funny. So I think those are the kinds of ways that I started to orient. It's like very ordinary to the point of like just making sure my environment was clean. I had clean clothes on instead of just wearing the same things over and over again. Also, I had a challenge of having a lunch time because it just started blending in. So I was like, okay, I need to have lunch sitting down without getting on the computer. So that took a while too for me to adjust to having a, a regular kind of day-to-day -day schedule that I think now it feels a little more doable. And the other thing I just wanted to say is I'm amazed at how um, 
adaptable we are as human beings. The amount of helping that happened in my neighborhood, amazing. People willing to do so much for each other, trying to adapt and bringing each other along. I think there was a tendency to, like you were saying, Polly, for the lure into the undifferentiated, especially the first three weeks, there was very little differentiation between the days of the week. Honestly, I hate to say it, but between the hours of the day started to blur. I'd get up early, drink some coffee. Even before my work schedule on Zoom began for the day, I would have spent a couple hours writing or reading or responding to things and through the whole day, all into the evening. And you know, I'd, go, I'd pop in and out and my, you know, I, my family and my wife and daughters were home and there we had family connections between times and um but there was this kind of continuous undifferent like one day that just didn't really have hours and you know one of our things that we we know well and when you establish a team and start to together to work is is creating the the body of you know, we use this term body, speech, mind, right? So the kind of ground, the body, how important that basic environment of schedule is. You know, often we've been doing it, helping other people establish that. And this was a, a reminder of like, oh, no, no, us too. We all need to do this. And we need to keep showering and keep putting on, dressing from, you know, also from the waist down, we need to dress, you know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> That's funny. I completely agree with everything, uh, Jack, you're saying, and Polly, you know, about the rhythm, the structure, having boundaries so we don't feel like all we're doing is working seven days a week. And I love the idea of bringing humor in because I think humor really can lighten things up, not like heavy. So I know I try to do that as well. And it, it also helps make things not so solid, feel so solid. One thing I have found really helpful is I've been starting my day with uh, time for prayer and practice and self-reflection. Think about what's going on in the world. Pray for those who are in great need. And, you know, also put my own life and my situation in perspective. It just naturally brings a lightness and a, a deep appreciation, really. You all have described how to, how to set up a way that works for you. Your clothing, your rhythms, your food. Which is all easy to drift when you when you lose points like we have. And Stephanie, you mentioned also getting up in the morning and going to bed at night with a certain kind of intentionality of mind and and working with tuning into how you're doing and offering prayers to others and so on. To the kitchen level standpoint of how like uh, to your control is presenting how to take care of yourself. It, it just makes me wonder have. Have you all had any particularly difficult emotional or experiences or states of mind that have come up in the context of this? I know I have, and I'd be curious how you all, if you have, and how you've dealt with those. I think, you know, um, what comes to my mind is a potential for more depression and a sense of um, isolation and loneliness that can turn more negative from the perspective of that this isn't okay to be feeling these things. Um, and I, I was speaking with my sister, um, Rupa, who my parents live with her in Austin, and we started to speak more about exchange. It's a different kind of exchange that can happen in the context of where she is. She's in the house all the time where, you know, my parents are elderly, they have their level of suffering and also depression and physical pain. And she started to speak about how she was feeling all of this heaviness. And, and I was relating with her as well. I have to really watch what I'm letting in, in way of news, for instance. I've actually started to take a day off from news because I just, I was like hyper vigilant. I wanted to make sure our communities were getting the right information. So I'm scouring through this news and that and what do I listen to? And I started to feel really flooded. And, and that, to me, had this sense of uh, kind of this heavy depression starting to form. So my sister and I were talking about, you know, there's a tendency to want to fix it or make it go away. Like, this isn't okay. We shouldn't be feeling this. And at, at some level of self-talk trying to bring us back online with, 
you know, doing um, more physical activity maybe, or trying to have, uh, uh, talking to ourselves about this isn't going to be forever. It, this is also has its own quality of impermanence. Also talking about watching this depression instead of like trying to make something out of it. At first acknowledging that it's there because there is a level of deep sadness for us acknowledging it together and somehow we felt some sense of connection and ease with talking about it together that we don't have to make it go away but can we just allow it to to be there because all the lives that are lost right in this kind of uh, unpredictable way where family members aren't able to be in person together that that just is so painful to hear and it and that's something I feel like I want to let in right so for me working with depression has to do with acknowledging this part of it and then in the particular example with my sister we are going through this and then you know, touching back on our prior conversation about we're in this together that seems to always help me. Like, it's not just a lip service thing. It, for the first time in my life, it really is so poignant what that really means now that we're in this together. So for me, you know, the, the level of depression and sometimes in the, towards the evening, I can have more of this, partly because I'm tired, partly because, you know, maybe I'm letting more news come in. So I have to watch how I'm doing my evenings. So instead, maybe I go for a walk, or as Stephanie was saying, reflecting, having more of this attitude of meditation or some kind of prayer that can come in. I've also been trying to integrate and using the time that we have towards the end of the day doing that. I was feeling a lot of physical buildup, being really pinned down in the house, and, and you know, there would be I would have days that went by where I'd move between four or five rooms in my house. And then at the same time, I felt like I spent the whole day, like one day in the max day I think I had was nine hours on video Zoom calls to 15 people. And it was like bang, 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 bang in a row. So there's this weird disconnect of feeling like I'd been all over in everybody's room, like even sitting here with you all and looking at the screen, I'm not, a part of me is not even in the room I'm in. I'm in the room that I'm seeing myself mm -hmm. in. And I'm, I'm in the room that I see each of you in. And then, then you multiply that through a day and through time. And it can be just kind of, kind of blows my sense out. And then I realize I haven't even moved my physical body out of like five rooms of my house. It's really quite a contrast. <clears throat> and, and I think, especially in the early weeks, and it was more winter here, and we had a series of storms and cold spells. And my body, I was just, my upper back was killing me, especially for hunching over these screens, which always, it's some reason, like I, I sometimes I, I'll put it up on something, so it's actually at eye level. Mm -hmm. But like today, it's down a little bit. So I'm like, you know, a whole day of this, and you start to just curl mm -hmm. forward. And then all this anxiety builds up, and quite physically, and then add on to it, I was binging national and mostly national news my common news sources were just were just off the charts alarming and it wasn't even contributing a lot of factual information it was alarm i've learned i have to really watch my media hygiene if you will it's like i've like had really bad media hygiene for a while i was just you know when i wasn't specifically focused on work pouring over news things and that was definitely making my kind of felt body toxic so i think that's been important to ground and not get my states of mind obliterated and scattered to all directions and i'm much better at that and lately when it's warm and uh, the springtime is coming on us even though we've had a we had a terrible to me this is a loss is like we had a terrible killing storm that just wiped out there will be no apple or fruit blossoms this year i'm sorry that's it boulder not going to have any and that to me is is sad but it's kind of poignant and appropriate that uh, we'd have this kind of killing storms but as it war opens up and it becomes warm and beautiful it's easier to walk and it's easier to be in in my body we'll publish part two of this conversation as our next journal entry and please visit us at windhorsecommunityservices.com slash journal where you can explore related resources register for alerts or join the dialogue
Windhorse Journal is a publication of Windhorse Community Services, supporting recovery from mental health challenges at home and in the community since 1981.